It's lunchtime. Amy and a friend have stopped for lunch at one of their favorite restaurants. Amy's having a burger, fries, and a chocolate shake. She knows the burger and fries have lots of fat and salt that's not good for her, and she's taking a risk with the shake. Like many people, Amy has a form of lactose intolerance. When she consumes milk products, it can result in abdominal cramping and diarrhea. Not a pleasant experience. But she's been looking forward to this shake all day, so this time she'll take the chance that everything will be all right. Why do we get hungry? What happens to the food we eat? Why is it important to limit our intake of certain foods? And how will Amy's shake affect her? You'll find the answers to these and other questions as we take a look at the human digestive system. When we get hungry, it's a signal that we need to eat. Food contains the energy and nutrients our bodies require to keep them working properly. But we can't use the energy and nutrients in food in the form in which they are consumed. So our digestive system has evolved to break down the biochemical compounds in food to release energy and convert nutrients to forms that are usable by our cells. For example, adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, is a biological compound that our cells use as their primary energy source. Here's how it works. A molecule of ATP contains a chain of three phosphates. When instructed to do so by an enzyme, ATP loses the endmost phosphate group, releasing energy in the process. This energy can then be used to contract muscles, pump blood, breathe, or whatever active work the body needs to do. The resulting molecule is adenosine diphosphate, or ADP. When energy is not immediately needed by our bodies, the reverse reaction takes place. Using energy obtained from food or sunlight, a chemical catalyst causes the third phosphate group to be attached to the ADP molecule, resulting in an ATP molecule. So the ATP molecule acts as a chemical battery, storing energy when it isn't needed, but able to release it instantly when it is. To sustain this energy transport and fuel other body processes, our bodies need both major and minor nutrients. Major nutrients consist of carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. Minor nutrients include vitamins and minerals. Without a full complement of both major and minor nutrients, the body will not function properly. Carbohydrates include sugars and starches. They both provide energy when the molecules are broken down. All carbohydrates contain atoms of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in the ratio of one carbon to two hydrogens and one oxygen. But most of the sugars in the body are six carbon sugars, so their formula is written like this. Carbohydrates come in three sizes. The first are monosaccharides, the simple sugars such as glucose. The body's biochemistry is based on the breakdown of glucose. Disaccharides are composed of two monosaccharides. Monosaccharides and disaccharides are found in fruits, honey, molasses, milk, and milk products, as well as common table sugar that comes from sugar beets or sugar cane. Polysaccharides are composed of chains of monosaccharides. The most important ones are starches and glycogen. Starches are the storage form of carbohydrate found in plants. Foods like potatoes, rice, wheat, and corn are all major sources of starches in the human diet. Glycogen is the storage form of carbohydrate found in all animals. Both glycogen and starches are made up of strings of glucose molecules linked end to end. If glucose is not immediately needed by our bodies, it is converted to glycogen and stored. If not enough glucose is available from what we eat, the liver begins breaking down glycogen to release glucose. Proteins, the second group of major nutrients, are made of long chains of amino acids. There are 20 different amino acids that are important to the human body. Those that our bodies cannot produce are called essential amino acids because it's essential that they be supplied by the food we eat. Unlike fat and starch, the human body doesn't store excess amino acids for later use, so they must be replenished every day. Proteins have many functions in the body. They are the main building blocks for cells and tissues. They're found in hormones, such as the human growth hormone, which helps regulate growth, 
and in enzymes which increase the rate of chemical reactions in the body. They provide strength to the tendons and ligaments that hold bones and muscle together. They help seal the skin and prevent water loss. The most complete sources of proteins are animal products, but plant products such as beans, peas, soy, and nuts can also provide amino acids. Fats, also called lipids, are the third type of major nutrient. Typically, lipids are referred to as oils if they are liquid at room temperature and fats if they are solid at room temperature. There are three kinds, phospholipids, triglycerides, and steroids. Phospholipids are mostly tied up in cell membranes and don't play a major part in energy metabolism. Triglycerides are a major energy source. They are composed of a three-carbon glycerol molecule with three fatty acids attached. Fatty acids are chains of carbon atoms. Attached to the carbons are hydrogen atoms. If all the possible hydrogen atoms are attached, as shown here, the fatty acid is called a saturated fat. If any of the hydrogen atoms are missing, it's called an unsaturated fat. You've probably heard that saturated fats, which are primarily found in animal products, aren't good for you because they can clog your arteries. The buildup of plaque, which is made up primarily of saturated fats, can restrict or completely cut off blood flow, causing a stroke or a heart attack. Steroids, another type of lipid, have hydrocarbon rings. Cholesterol is one of the most important of the steroids. It forms the basic structure for the reproductive hormones testosterone and estrogen. Cholesterol is also incorporated into cell membranes and the walls of red blood cells to make them pliable. In addition to the major nutrients, the body requires small amounts of minor nutrients, the vitamins and minerals. Vitamins are organic compounds that regulate metabolism and assist in the biochemical processes that release energy from digested foods. Minerals are inorganic elements that function as coenzymes, enabling the body to perform its various functions, including energy production, growth, and healing. Once nutrients have entered the body, they are involved in a wide range of biochemical reactions. One of the most important is the breakdown of glucose to produce ATP, the source of energy for all of our cells. This process involves three connected chemical pathways, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Glucose enters glycolysis as a six carbon sugar. During the process, two ATP molecules are produced, and glucose comes out as three carbon molecules called pyruvic acid. Next, pyruvic acid loses a carbon dioxide and forms an acetyl group. The acetyl group combines with a form of vitamin B6, resulting in a compound called acetyl-coenzyme A, or acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA then delivers the acetyl group to the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle removes electrons from hydrogen and sends them on to the third phase, the electron transport chain. Each time the Krebs cycle turns, it produces a molecule of ATP. The waste product is carbon dioxide. Finally, the electrons from the acetyl group enter the electron transport chain where electrons are passed between chemicals. The result is 34 molecules of ATP, which can be used as energy. It seems like a contradiction, but when food enters Amy's mouth, it still doesn't enter her body. The digestive system is really nothing more than a very long tube with openings at both ends. As food passes through the tube, it's processed and gradually broken down so that nutrients can be absorbed by the cells lining this tube. Only when these nutrients are absorbed into these cells and passed on to the blood and lymph does food truly enter the body. Throughout the digestive tube, the walls are composed of four layers. From the innermost out, they are the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis, and the serosa, or adventitia. The innermost part of the mucosa, the epithelium, is composed of a layer of absorptive columnar cells. All nutrients must pass through these cells to enter the body. Goblet cells in this layer secrete mucus to aid the movement of food along the digestive tube. 
The submucosa, the second major layer of the digestive tube wall, contains blood vessels, lymph nodules, and nerves to assist in regulating the digestive process. The third major layer, the muscularis, has two layers of smooth muscle that propel digestive contents through the tube with a process called peristalsis. Above the diaphragm, the outermost layer of the digestive tube is called the adventitia. Below, it's called the serosa. When Amy takes a bite of her hamburger, she begins the digestive process by breaking her food into a manageable size. As she chews, her teeth grind the food that mixes with her saliva into a pulpy consistency called a bolus. There are two components to the digestive process, physical and chemical, and both begin in the mouth. The physical aspects occur when we bite and tear, chew and grind our food. The chemical digestion involves saliva produced by the salivary glands. The mouth is bounded on the top by the palate. In front, the palate has bone above the tissue lining the mouth and is called the hard palate. The soft palate at the top rear has skeletal muscle rather than bone above it. The salivary glands produce saliva when stimulated by the presence of food or even by the thought or smell of food. The act of swallowing involves a complex series of reflexes. First, the soft palate rises to close the connection with the nasal passage. The tongue blocks re-entry of food into the mouth. The larynx, or voice box, rises, causing the epiglottis to cover the opening to the trachea, closing off the windpipe. When the esophagus senses the presence of a food bolus, it stretches, causing muscle contraction that results in the process of peristalsis that moves the bolus toward the stomach. The esophagus passes through the muscular wall called the diaphragm just before it enters the stomach. The connection between the esophagus and the stomach is called the cardiac sphincter. Food passing into the stomach stretches its walls, resulting in pressure on the stretch receptors. They in turn stimulate cells in the stomach lining to begin producing various enzymes and hydrochloric acid. Some of the food entering the stomach stays in the fundus, which serves as a storeroom or staging area, until there is room in the body of the stomach. Three different layers of smooth muscle allow the stomach to compress its contents in all directions, blending the food bolus with digestive juices. The lining of the stomach also secretes a large amount of mucus to protect its interior walls from the hydrochloric acid. At the end of the stomach, the pyloric sphincter regulates the amount of food that enters the small intestine. Its opening and closing is controlled by the amount of food in the stomach and by feedback from the small intestine. The interplay between the small intestine and the stomach ensures that the small intestine receives chyme. Chyme is the name we give to the output of the stomach. The stomach releases its output in smaller amounts that the small intestine can handle. The small intestine is a tube about 20 feet long that is bent, folded, and twisted to fit into the abdominal cavity. It has three parts, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Chyme enters the duodenum, which is about 10 inches long. It then passes to the jejunum, about 3 feet long, and finally into the ileum, which is about 6 feet long. The lining of the small intestine has villi and microvilli, Villi are finger-like projections on the surface of the intestine, and microvilli are smaller projections stemming from the villi. Each villus contains both blood and lymphatic capillaries. Materials absorbed in the small intestine pass into one of these two capillaries. The liver, gallbladder, and pancreas provide bile, hormones, and digestive enzymes to aid the digestive process. About nine quarts of water enter the small intestine every day. Most of this water is reabsorbed during the digestive process. Any leftover water, nutrients, and waste enter the large intestine. The large intestine is a tube about 5 feet long and 2 and a half inches in diameter with four major sections, the cecum, the colon, the rectum, and the anal canal. Material from the small intestine enters the cecum and awaits passage to the colon. 
The appendix is open to the cecum at one end and closed at the other. It plays no role in the digestive process but has large masses of lymphoid tissue which may play a role in the immune system. At more than three and a half feet, the colon is the longest section of the large intestine. It's made up of four sections, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, and the sigmoid colon. There are some differences in the walls of the small and large intestines. First of all, the mucosa of the large intestine has no villi like the small intestine did to absorb nutrients. The reason for this is that when digestion is functioning normally, most of the usable nutrients are already absorbed before the chyme passes into the large intestine. Secondly, mucus secreting cells increase in number along the length of the large intestine. This is because water is absorbed as the processed food passes through the large intestine. The additional mucus helps the intestinal contents pass through as they become increasingly dehydrated. Along the length of the colon, regular constrictions of the outer layer of the muscularis called the tenia coli result in the appearance of a series of pouches called haustra. As the chyme passes from haustra to haustra, the mixing and churning that results continues physical digestion. The chemical digestion that occurs is carried out by bacteria. The bacteria found in the large intestine are called normal flora because they're normally found in the colon. For their own metabolism and growth, these bacteria make use of whatever carbohydrates pass through the large intestine, but they also produce nutrients for the human host, such as vitamin K, which the liver uses to make proteins involved in blood clotting. Without these normal intestinal bacteria, a person may develop serious vitamin deficiencies. Defecation results from the chyme or feces moving by peristalsis to the rectum, causing its walls to stretch. This triggers the defecation reflex. There are two sphincter muscles in the anal canal. The defecation reflex causes the first sphincter muscle to open, allowing feces to enter the anal canal. The second sphincter, made of skeletal muscle, is under voluntary control and can remain closed. Some people like Amy have conditions that affect the way the body digests food. Lactose intolerance is a condition in which the body doesn't produce enough of the enzyme lactase. Lactase is an important enzyme to break down lactose, a sugar found in dairy products. That means that lactose can't be absorbed by the small intestine. Instead, it passes on into the large intestine where it ends up being digested by bacteria. In this process, these bacteria produce gas and other chemicals that end up creating discomfort for the lactose intolerant person. A short time after drinking her shake, Amy may experience diarrhea, gas, bloating, and abdominal cramps. The severity of these symptoms will depend on how much lactase Amy's body actually produces. Today, an estimated 60% of Americans are overweight and 25% are obese. The incidence of overweight and obesity has increased for a number of reasons. Today, we lead a more sedentary lifestyle where we spend most of our time sitting at a desk or in front of the TV. People are eating more, but less healthy foods. Fast foods full of fat and calories have replaced more well-balanced, home-cooked meals. Because of our increasingly overweight population, the incidence of type 2 diabetes has increased dramatically. A diet high in saturated fats contributes to the development of arteriosclerosis, or hardening of the arteries, which ultimately results in heart attacks and strokes. Fast-acting carbohydrates, such as are found in sugared soft drinks, candy, chips, and white bread, break down quickly, flooding the body with glucose. A rapid rise in glucose may contribute to the development of diabetes but this excess glucose also ends up being converted to glycogen, then to fat if it isn't burned up through exercise. Let's take a closer look at Amy's lunch. In all, she consumed 1,520 calories. 62 grams, or 550 of the calories, came from fat. If she had substituted a diet soda for the shake, she would have consumed only 940 calories and 48 grams of fat. Downsizing the fries from a large to a small would drop the total calories to 670 and the fat to 34 grams. The number of calories and amount of fat in Amy's meal 
may be acceptable occasionally, but eaten regularly, meals like this can cause weight gain, type 2 diabetes, and other long-term harm to the body. A new food guide pyramid designed by researchers at Harvard University suggests that Americans need to eat more whole grains, fruits and vegetables, and less red meat and refined grains. Along with better food choices, reduced portion size and more exercise will help keep our digestive systems working well and our bodies healthy now and into the future. <music>